Welcome to Drinks Coach. It's Drinks Coach. It's been a while, I know. We continue to have major catastrophes with our plumbing in the flat. Um, also, I'm getting quite nervous because we're getting close to the big 100. Episode 98, this one. Vine sack or lowercase or Drinks Coach UK or lowercase. Please contact me on any social media you want. Um, what are we doing today? Um, I'm doing a mop-up. There's been so much stuff sent to me which I've been interested in um, that I just thought it's worth mentioning. You know, There's a few cool stories out there, some great products, some local products. Seems that people are being very innovative during their time locked down. So uh, what should we start with? Well, we'll start with this. A couple of vodkas. Right, so we're going to do some vodkas, we're going to do some gin, maybe a couple of whiskies. Um a little chit chat about all of them so let's start with this one uh, thank you Izzy uh, really great PR out there who sent me all sorts of cool stuff um, also does the PR for Coates and Seeley one of the great one of the great est sparkling wines in the UK from the wonderful chalk downs of Hampshire which I believe is where it's at this is where all the great wines are going to come from uh, once people understand that um, I think the price of real estate in Hampshire is going to go up quite fast so where should we start? We've got a nice little Haute de glass. Look at that. I mean, isn't that like the cutest label in the world? That's like painted on. It's actually in relief. <laughs> and the little thing that reminds of Windy Miller in Campbellwick Green at the bottom there. There's a little lady at the bottom planting a tree, is it? Sapling, British vodka. Made from British wheat. 100% British wheat. Not only is this really good vodka, but every time you buy a bottle, they plant a tree. So, uh, yeah, let's start off with a really feel-good, fuzzy-wuzzy story. Um, what did I think when I first tasted it? When I first tasted it, God, this is all about honesty, found it a little bit kind of edgy. Um, but there are different ways, there are different expressions of wheat vodka. You can have wheat vodka, which comes from very green, just germinate shoots, dicotyledon, um, like the spelt flavours you have in Conic's Tale, a vodka I did way back near the beginning of uh, lockdown. Uh, or you can have a, a slightly toastier um, wheat vodka. And this is, the, this is more toasty. When I smell it, it almost smells of um, rich tea biscuits, which I like. There is a creaminess, there is a slightly kind of like lily of the valley kind of overlay of fruit, greenness. But generally speaking, wheat vodka is just so much more accessible with various sort of foods and things. If you're going to have vodka with caviar, for example, wheat vodka, it's got a soft, creamy, almost vanilla ice cream texture to it, which some grain vodka simply don't have. Uh, tree... 7384. So they ain't mucking about. That's a lot of trees, right? Anyway, this is just a half bottle. But a whole bottle of this rather good wheat vodka is, I think, a pretty reasonable £25. £25.70 or something. Whiskey Exchange Master and Malt. I can't remember where I found it initially. So, premium drink. Really good wheat vodka. Not the greatest wheat vodka, but great story. Gorgeous packaging, man. And, uh... Very nice, as I discovered, in a Bloody Mary. So here we have the next drink that Izzy sent me. Um, and you know that I love my Bloody Marys. I think I've already shown three or four ways to do it on the channel. This is Big big Chef, Little Chef. Um, this comes from a company called um, The Pickle House, who actually pickle up or make or res I don't know, reserve the pickle from dill pickles. And they sell it to you in jars. So you can have what we call a pickle back, which is a shot of bourbon. Mm, delicious. Elijah Craig. And then a little crunchy bit of dill pickle. And then you shoot the pickle juice. And an extraordinary thing happens. I mean, if you don't like vinegar, you're really going to be off this. But I'm half German, half Swedish. My life evolves around pickling shit, okay? And this is um, uh, a company that's doing a really great job of sourcing premium, premium tomato juice. You can really taste the quality in this. And making a spiced tomato mix. So it's kind of an instant Bloody Mary. Not quite instant. I'd probably add a spice mix on my own. Bloody Benz, if you know um, uh, my preferences, is a really, really good mix. Um, or just a bit of Worcester sauce on top, just to give it some darkness. But this is a spicy mix, which has pickle juice in it. Never really thought of that before, but it works really well. Makes a fantastic Bloody Mary. Uh, details on the uh, doodah down underneath this, if you look on the computer. And it got two stars in the Taste Awards. 
Don't knock the taste of woods, they're usually pretty good. So, all right, Izzy, enough, okay. So, moving on, we're gonna go on to this, which is another vodka. Check this bottle again, I mean, talk about bottles. You can just see the Excalibur sword and the stone behind it. Oh, that's so cool. And when it's full of vodka, which it was once, um, it sort of like magnifies through the liquid. It's quite brilliant. And you can see there's a Roman helmet at the bottom there. This kind of like, I can't remember what the, 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 the Roman sword is called. Um, but the actual vodka itself is a made in Britain vodka called Nero. Nero vodka. Um, it looks beautiful. It's kind of like they've picked a name out of history, which sounds good. But the packaging is unmistakably good. And the quality of this vodka is very, very high. Um, it's a little dearer than the other one. I've got some prices written down here. Yeah, this is £35 for a bottle of vodka. So we're in premium vodka territory. But this is made from potatoes. Um, if you go back to me talking about Chase Vodka and Chase Gin, um, which used to be associated with Tyrrell Crisps, they make a gin out of potatoes and a vodka out of potatoes. And uh, James Chase, who very recently has sold a very large part of his business to Diageo, the world's largest drinks giant. Congratulations, James and fam. You worked so hard for this. And I'm sure you're going to be set up for life now. I'm sure that they would have given you a ton of money for that. I mean, tons of money. So well done. Bless you. Work, well done for working so hard every day of your life at such a young age to drive a brand which, frankly, has now got real worldwide accreditation. Big up the chase. So... Um, yeah, Chase Vodka, he was telling me that it takes 200 kilos or 200 potatoes to make one bottle or one litre of um, vodka. That, that doesn't sound very productive, you know, because one large King Edwards can make two whole bags of Tyrrell's crisps, which you can sell for £5 profit, let's say, after packaging and distribution and everything else. Um, 200 kilos or 200 whole potatoes to make one litre of drink, which you're actually really, after you've uh, you paid the duty, only really selling for about a 15 to 20 pound profit. Uh, extraordinary. Anyway, just to taste this, um, so people have an understanding of the difference between potato vodka and wheat vodka. Immediately the smell is sweeter. I know you can't smell sweetness, but there's a... I know... Uh, Victorian sponge quality about it. There's um, a real kind of purity to the, the sugars. Oh, it's very, very smooth. Very, very smooth. Potato vodka tends to be kind of like, shape-wise, has to, it has a sweet, tangy mid-palate. Both ends are very soft. I think wheat vodka tends to sort of start off quite broad and then just softens away and sort of melts in the mouth. And then if you're looking for single grain or barley vodkas, like Belvedere, for example, or Grey Goose, they're going to be very, very linear and very concentrated. Um, they all had different shapes, right? But let's face it, vodkas all smell pretty much the same. There are subtle differences. Anyway, so, well done, Britain. Two more premium vodkas to add to the fold. Bravo. Okay, right, that's vodka done. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, let's look at three gins that I've been sort of harbouring for quite a long time now. This one I've been harbouring for way too long. Art Miller, my dear friend. I'm sorry it spent that much time sitting in the cupboard. Boy, I've got some gins for you here. Wow, these gins are good. Okay, so I've written some more prices down. I just want to get the prices right today. Um, <laughs> here we go. Yes, yeah, so let's start off with this. I'm in a silly spirit. I didn't even bother looking up the price, but I know you can buy a Master of Malts and Whiskey Exchange type places. But look, this is from the Isle of Scilly. It's called Silly Spirit. And it, it's the shape of the Scilly Isles lighthouse. And it's absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of the shape of a kind of a mallet hammer for knocking bungs into barrels. Uh, I don't know if that was, in, it was also kind of maybe a side intent, but many design awards. I have a design award here, Arthur, which I picked up for you because you live all the way out in Silly Isles from London. I think I've had it for a year and a half now. Time to pick it up and time to bring me a bottle of your new Navy Strength one, which comes in the blue bottle. Huh? Yeah, I've done my research. Um, but this is a fantastic gin. Okay. It's punchy. It's not It's not a quiet gin. And I know Arthur Miller for, from... Um, um, working very fondly with him back in the day when I was working in communications and PR where he was um, one of the people that ran 
Ernest and Julio Gallo, at the time the world's largest wine brand down in Cali, um, just sort of like near Uxbridge. Uh, and um, very, very interesting chat, very creative marketeer. Um, and, and we enjoyed Chell's company greatly. So this is a, a nod to you, Art. Silly Spirit. I mean, the packaging's great. Isn't that, that kind of, it's a really gift, good gifting gin. Um, but also, I'd, I'd love to go down there, maybe take a trip down to see Solcom and Padstow and Silly Gin and do, do a little gin tour. Oh, lovely strong smell of pink peppercorns, which I'm a massive fan of. Um, unmistakably so. Or maybe even green peppercorns, like the like a tiger curry from India. Sorry, Thailand. <laughs> the palate's got strong citrus. It then breathes out sort of kind of like a very strong coriander seed. More cardamom. More pepper, really lovely. I mean, it's it's aromatic, almost like molten brown shower gel is aromatic. It kind of makes you feel, not. I almost feel like I can wear it. It's so nice, um, but very, very loud, very noisy. If you like a nice, punchy, full flavored gin and tonic with a full strength tonic, big slice of lemon, lots of ice. Um, this is right up there. If you go back to my uh, gins for gin and tonics show, which is ooh, probably right back in the twenties, I think, something like that. Um, I did mention uh, the number three gin from uh, Berry Brothers and Rudd, which is still a world classic, but this uh, runs it very, very close. If not, in fact, on the right day, probably a better choice. So brilliant gin and tonic gin. That's all I'm saying about that. And that's all most of you need your gin for. Moving on uh, to two extraordinary drinks. Um, this is um, uh, a gin which I can't remember whether I connected or whether um, she came to me. Um, but Sarah Withers um, set up a, a gin company. Um, I think there's an association with, with her mother. I think it might have passed away from uh, cancer, I think. I don't, don't get me wrong, but there's some money that goes towards cancer in every bottle that you buy here. It comes in extraordinary packaging. It's got a vanilla lock, which is sort of like very easy to open and shut. And you can use the bottle for a million other things, maybe bath salts or olive oil or something, because it's a clear bottle. Beautiful packaging, very pristine. But this is what I want to really draw my attention to. This is from the IWSC, the International Wine and Spirits Competition. Uh, but I don't judge a spirit competition. Uh, if I was to judge a spirit competition, it's probably the one. But I work for the International Wine Chance, so there's a bit of a kind of like mm, uh, a crossing the line situation there. Um, but um, I, I, they've also they've been very kind of giving me awards for journalism in the past, which is very nice. I am the person, the only person, in fact, to win Communicator of the Year twice. 1996, no, sorry, in 2005. 2016 um, but if you look at this it says gold outstanding and it got 98 points now I know when they judge the international wine spirit competition they're in a room the glass comes out you don't know what the, the product is it just looks like this with a number on the bottom of it and everyone <laughs> gets to judge without any discussion so this averaged 98 out of 100 points, there was probably almost nothing in the entire competition that had a higher average than that. And we're talking about a competition that attracts 2,000, 3,000 pound bottles of whiskey. Um, it's, I was just so curious to know what a 98 point gin tastes like, especially because I've been espousing to you all about what's good and what's not about gin. And a lot of gins are pretty crap, and some gins are really extraordinary, and I'm trying to teach you the difference. So, it is very very refined um also not a surprise or it's not a coincidence that the main botanical is hearties which is the flower of remembrance uh which may be something to her mother very very fine product um this in of itself is a gin brand this is called g1 when i smell it i can smell some of the really really intense aromas there's a really punchy quite very classy uh, hit of juniper. Juniper can take all sorts of forms. Uh, and this is somewhere between like Macedonian juniper or Tuscan juniper. It's kind of very firm. It's not big and rich and fat and oily. It's tight and spicy, almost nutmeggy, in fact. There's a hint of cardamom there. Again, I can smell some peppercorn. The palate's just divine. It's delicious. 40 quid. If I'm going to spend 40 quid on a bottle of gin, 
it's 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 worth 40 quid i mean it's really really good let's think about the other best gins out there cotswold gin still beautiful the dovey valley distillery in wales which i've talked about many a time actually costs more than this because they only sell half litre bottles but that's still the best gin i've ever tasted in the world sulcum gin it's up it's in that it's, we're right up there now where is it made well in fact it's made here and Sarah Withers, with these, with us, Sarah Withers um, makes her gin at the Bond Street Distillery, which is an old uh, lingerie factory in uh, Leicester. And this, in fact, is a distillery owned by a lady called Sally Faulkner. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, Sally Faulkner. And what was lovely was they sent me both gins to try. Sally's gin and Sarah's gin. This gin is just sublime, and I can see why it got such high scores. It's the kind of gin that actually would get a higher score if you judge it clinically than if you want to get emotional about it. It'd be quite fun to compare these two together because they're both made in the same place. And I do love that packaging. This is Bond Street Signature London Dry Gin. If it's a London Dry Gin, want another award down there for some gin club award. Um, and uh, it's a very, very good quality gin, very punchy. Uh, again, a bit more characterful, I think a little bit looser. A little bit more open. What did I get off here? I was tasting, uh, yeah, a lot of orange blossom. Again, pepper. Uh, let's try this again. I'm quite sure there might be some um, uh, zirben. It smells like like Swiss pine cone smell. Ah, oh, it's lovely. It smells like it's like walking into IKEA um, with a gin and tonic in your hand. Which is fantastic. Um, absolutely delicious. Uh, but when you look at refinement and drinking on its own. Wow, that's pretty good. Let's try this. Ah, it's just got a little bit more... A little bit more expression. It's a bit louder. A little less refined. Well, no, refined's the wrong word. Um... I just feel that I'd get on really well with Sally. It's kind of a good time aroma, very strong, but very complimentary aromas. Nothing's out of, out of out of kilter. Very well balanced. Mm, lovely peppery cardamomy finish. Pink peppercorn again. I think maybe we'll, actually black peppercorns maybe. Really good gin and tonic gin again. I would love to try that with bitter lemon, or in a strong winter martini. I think with an olive. Really nice. Mm. Ice really opens them up. There you have it. Three gins. We've done two vodkas, three gins. What's next? Oh, by the way, 40 quid, 35 pounds. Um, buy them both and decide which one you like because you will not be disappointed. If you like classic gin, especially proper traditional London dry gin, where it's all percolated, cart head distilled, then... Um, you're going to love this. And the other one is also quite delicious and sublime um, in beautiful packaging. So, <clears throat> oh, missed out a gin. How could I, Ed? Sorry, Charlie. Sorry, Ed. This is Wood Brothers Gin. Well, look at the packaging. The label is nuts. That is all put on by hand. And apparently one in four breaks... So the cost of the packaging is Looney Tunes. We've got this gorgeous green. The vodka comes in a similar blue with a wonderful transfer copper overlay of basically their still house. And here in the front is Charlie and Ed right there. Ed learned how to make gin at a place called Ragnarok in Sweden. Half Svensk. Big man. Uh, making a very, very Swedish style gin. Um, really learned his ways. His parents have a farm which literally butts onto Br RAF Bryce Norton. And for those people who don't know, I was in the Royal Air Force 2, which is right on the corner of the Cotswolds and is the main freight terminal for the and, and passenger terminal for the Royal Air Force and for the Army. And it's where people were repatriated when they fell during the wars of um, Afghanistan and Iraq. And they have a farm. And they produce botanicals on the farm. They produce their own barley and wheat on the farm. And uh, this is batch number 64, bottle number 36, it's all handwritten, real detail, no compromise, um, lots of juniper, which I like. Um, this is more the all kind of Macedonian style, loose as a goose, big spicy juniper, bit of oil to it. Yeah, very, very fine liquor, very fine spirit. We like these guys because these guys are where we make this. So, those people remember 
Reverend Hubert's Winter Gin Liqueur, Reverend Hubert's Spiced Gin Liqueur. Uh, it's still out there, it's still available for sale, still great for hot toddies and watching the World Championship skiing, which I'm doing at the moment. Uh, just delicious. If you want to remind yourself of what a Fort Mason mince pie tastes like, go and buy some more. It's absolutely fantastic. There's nothing on the market like it. We think it's probably the best winter gin or the best winter liqueur on the market, bar none. We had so much press. Please go online and see. Uh, don't take our word for it. Take everyone else's. Absolutely fantastic. And it's Gary Barlow's favourite drink. We're in conversation with him about other things another time. So, proper gin this. Um, not mucking about. Needs to be, it needs a, lem, a wedge of lemon. It needs an olive. It's kind of asking for other flavours. It's a no compromise, classic, um, homemade, um, farm made gin. Everything on site, which is wonderful uh, and sets it apart. Again, around the 35 36 pounds mark but uh pay peanuts get monkeys but i just did, thought it was about time that i gave a shout out to ed and charlie beautiful products in a great great packaging um there you go i should be drinking those later waste not want not <sighs> when will it ever end <laughs> okay right whiskey time now I was talking to my good friend, Dean Callan. Please watch Dean Callan's show. Go on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to Dean Callan. Uh, we're going to do quite a lot of work this month uh, talking about South African wines. I mean, double gold medal winning competition winners to tell you about what the really best wines in South African Africa can offer you. Um, and I've been on a few of his shows too. Uh, he told me about this product because I was saying I love um, sherry finished whiskies. And this is a project between two of my favourite drinking houses, um, the the great Richard Patterson of White and Mackay slash William Grants um, slash Dalmore slash lots of things. Um, he's the master distiller, master noser blender for White and Mackay, which is almost without doubt the most underrated blended whiskey on the market and I'm a big fan uh, they used to make our whiskies for us when I was uh, a spirit bar at Waitrose in fact um, and he made a collab with Tony Antonio Flores who is the main dude at Gonzales Bias in Spain where they made a whiskey this is a blended whiskey it's not a malt and they made a whiskey in Scotland and it spent five years in sherry butts Oloroso butts and Monteado butts then got transported Nomad, get it, right? Nomad, very cool packaging. Um, got transported all the way to Jerez and then rested next to the Brandy de Jerez and everything in Spain, where, of course, it's no longer allowed to be called Scotch, is it? It's finished in sherry casks. I don't know. It's just called Nomad Outland Whiskey. It's a small batch whiskey, which then spent one year, and to quote JJ Goodman of London Cocktail Club chain, putting anything in PX barrels is cheating because you could wee in an PX barrel and you'd drink it, taste delicious. <laughs> it's just Pedro Simenez barrels are just infused with vanilla treacle. Um, so after five years in Sherry Butts, this has been rested in uh, PX barrels for a wee bit longer. I can see Richard laughing as I pour this, if he ever gets to see this. Uh, Mr. Patterson, to you, sir. Never forget when I did my Wine and Spirit Education Trust wine diploma, I think that's level four, they call it now. And on my very birthday, you let me taste a 60-year-old Dalmore from, I think, 1896 or something. I think I can still taste it, if I'm fair. And it's your fault that I'm an alcoholic. Well, not really, but uh, a whiskey lover. Should we call it that? It sounds so much better. Okay, so, Nomad, uh, this is ludicrous, actually, what you get for it. It's uh, 30 quid, 29.95, so it's the price of, I don't know, a bottle of Chivas, I guess. Oh, God. It's so warm and cosy. Boris, by the way, sorry, that's right. Boris Ivan, who's a brand ambassador for Gonzalez Bias, he's the one that actually had this sent to me. Uh, so thank you very much for the treat. As you can see, um, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it, I think. Um, <laughs> he reminded me about it today, and I thought I'd better talk about it before I, I drink it all. So, um... It's like Demerara Sugar shaken over a cafe affogato, which is espresso with a ball of vanilla ice cream in it. Oh, that's so nice. Like black treacle. It's, it's just so delicious underneath it all. 
Um, and I know the Richard Patterson, if you look at the Dalmore expressions at the moment, the cigar expression, Dalmore 12, Dalmore 18, these are big, dark, sherried whiskies with huge flavour and are my cosiest companion during the winter. Fantastic producer of whiskies. There we go. So, that's Nomad. Bring me on to Daddy Rack. Now, it's not every day you see a new American whiskey hit the market with such aspiration. Nor is it often that you hear somebody making a, an American whiskey brand who is English. James Arthur Rackham, a.k.a. Daddy Rack. And yes, that's a picture of him. I was on a Zoom chat with him a couple of days ago. His hair's grown since then. He's halfway between there and the Big Lebowski now. Um, and this label from Stranger and Stranger has to be beautiful, gorgeous, textured label. Lots of interest on it. Um, nothing left to the imagination. All sorts of information is on the bottle. It's fantastic. Um, what is it? It's a whiskey made in Tennessee. What's the most famous Tennessee whiskey you can think of? Correct. Jack Daniels. I mean, giant. The, gi the giant of American whiskey. Tennessee Sour Mash. Um, after that, in Tennessee whiskey terms, uh, there is George Dickel, which is another giant distiller. A lot of money, a lot of investment, and people that have been making whiskey for many, many years wanted to do, do things right, and have come together to produce another distilling company. I think I was right in calling it the Tennessee Distilling Company. Not sure. Um, James did tell me the other night. And James got in there at the ground floor and said, I want a young, small batch, well-made corn whiskey. Now I say corn whiskey because, of course, when you make bourbon, it has to be 50% or 51% corn. That's sweet corn to you and me. Um, but they often then get quite a lot of barley thrown in, a little bit of wheat. If you've got a wheat and whiskey like Weller or something like that, or maybe a high rye component in the what we call mash bill, which is the recipe. No, this is 80% corn, 10% uh, rye and 10% barley. Um, it's only three years old. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Jack is younger than that. But... Um, Tennessee whiskey, you see it says it's called Tennessee straight whiskey. It's not been fooled around with. This is an important statement. It doesn't say Tennessee sour mash or Tennessee whiskey. It says Tennessee straight whiskey. And there's a lot of exciting things going on with Tennessee at the moment. You may have heard me talk about an amazing whiskey called Uncle Nearest, which is expensive but absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Fawn, the CEO of the company, she's an extraordinary woman to contend with and doing great things for the Ameri for the, the Me Too movement and empowering women in, the, in, in, in a very, very male scene. And... Um, I know. Uh, James is in there too, doing his little bit. And this is this is not available online yet. I've looked in Master of Malta. I've looked in a whiskey exchange, and nobody's selling it yet. This will be on the shelf for thirty five ninety nine for a bottle of American whiskey. Um, it's been double mellowed, which means well, there's a process in Tennessee whiskey manufacture called the Lincoln County process, where you use um, ma maple charcoal in order to reduce the hard edges of a whiskey and if done poorly it can pull out a lot of other important stuff too but done gently done right with the right quality of charcoal and if it's a drip trip pro, drip process and in this case it's done twice it's been mellowed twice through charcoal just lots of charcoal in the barrel comes out the other side goes back in you can end up with a drink which is just indescribably smooth and pure and you can tell where the ingredients are from again this is like uh, where were we? The Wood Brothers thing. This is like a farm distillery almost. Although it's a giant rick house, a giant distillery, the bit that he's getting, he has total control over. He knows where he's getting his corn from. And I've got to tell you, James is, has a famous background in drink, and I've known him for a long time. And his father uh, was responsible for having a lot of wine shops called Rackham's, Arthur Rackham's, um, which I think then merged with Peter Dominic's like, back in the day before I joined Obbin. So we're going back into the late 80s, I think, or early mid 80s. And um, very famously, um, sort of like it was a wine merchant. Um, James Rackham, James Arthur Rackham, aka Daddy Rackham, <laughs> um, has loved whiskey all his life. He got married on Isla. Uh, I think that's a statement in its own right. But he is the byword. If you go into any supermarket in the UK, Tesco's, Waitrose, Sainsbury, you name it, and you buy good cognac at a crazy price. They're VS Cognacs. If, you try, if you've ever tried supermarket VS Cognac recently, it's astonishing stuff. And if you look at my show about groovy drinks for Christmas, you saw there was Comte de Lovia Armagnac. I was talking about um, Chairman's Reserve Spice Rum from St. Lucia. These are all a part of his big company. And his company is called Emporia brands. Gavin, 
McGowan, who I've mentioned before, is his kind of brand ambassador, knows everything kind of dude, and one of the most likable human beings in the entire drinks industry, certainly in London anyway. And um, anyway, James and I go back because he remembers me from, from uh, tasting uh, cognacs and stuff when I was a wine buyer at Waitrose, which the, uh, the head spirit buyer then, Derek Strange, and his assistant Nick Van Hagen, had a meeting and James said, how do you know how to taste spirits? And I didn't really realise that he noticed that I could. Um, but it was that which triggered him to say, can we have a Zoom chat? Because I want you to put this whiskey on your show. So thank you, James. And thank you, Veronica. It's PR, uh, Alex PR, doing a fantastic job. Um, she's covering some uh, tequila, which I'm doing in the next show as well. Wow. It doesn't have any volatility or any vinegariness. When you smell, it smells almost like crushed sweet corn porridge like sweet corn dipped in butter it's such a pure corn smell with a beautiful new white oak veneer this lovely vanillary kiss to it it just goes it just disappears absolutely delicious if you're in the states and you find this it's 30 dollars i mean they've got a very very different um taxing and um, duty structure so this is extraordinary value for money over there what can i say if you like american whiskey you like jack and you know you, you're not afraid of maybe paying paying money for, like for gentleman jack or small batch or you like a small batch bourbon to have a go at this this is under 40 pounds and as james says age isn't everything and this drink is nice at this age it doesn't need to be older than this maybe there'll be an older expression one day but i've got to tell you this is the most enjoyable session whiskey i've come across since last year well done mr rackham good luck danny rack see you next time mm -hmm.